Hello and welcome to another episode of the Little Knowledge Podcast, where this week we'll be exploring something of a paradise lost, really. Piercefield Park, once famed throughout Britain and in even parts of Europe, uh, near Chepstow. Um, now, my name is Paul Busby and as ever, I'm with Gough Morgan. Hello, Gough. Hello, hello, hello. Greetings, how, Joe. How are you, Gough? Okay, fine and dandy. Slightly harassed in personal life, but I don't avoid my troubles. I don't, I don't think there's a single person alive in this country at the moment who isn't harassed <laughs> no, by their no, personal no, no, life. No, just the car broke down. Uh, and then imagine when your car breaks down, you have to then get home on public transport. And then, and then sort of think like, I do not have such a thing in my bag as a mask. What do I do? Did you fold your think? beard up? No, I bought one off the bloke in the company. Yeah, I could have just folded it over my, cold it over my head that way. <laughs> that would have been all right. Pulled my t-shirt over my head. It would have solved everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but now I'm fine and dandy. Had a nice day. So there we are. Looking into interesting facts, which we shall share we, with our viewer later. We, our viewer is right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Humble viewer, you know of who we speak. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we've got, we, like I said, we've got a small mini bus of subscribers at yeah. the moment, which is nice. We love every single one of them. Yes, yes, we, we, we rain hot, passionate kisses upon the upturned petal of your faces. And also a little bit of thanks to Lan Rumney Hall, uh, the trust there. That was a nicely received video, actually. People have been very kind about that one. Oh, that um, was good. And we got a retweet from them, and they put us on okay. Facebook and, and all sorts. So that was great support from uh, oh, Lan Rumney Hall. That. That's very nice. So as you say, it's a mutual admiration society between us and the <laughs> people. <laughs> oh, we love them. They love us. Now, Piercefield. Uh, I yeah. have to be honest. Um, I think I've been there in passing, but I, I haven't done this walk, this famous walk. Have you ever done it? Uh, no, funny enough. I've only ever seen pictures of it in decline through a fence in a very overgrown field so that's yeah. my own knowledge of Pierce Field though I did on Thursday actually drive through St Albans um, right. which again because um, Wells spent a lot of money one of the owners we're talking about spent a lot of money on the church there mm. um, and one of the pubs as you go through is called the Pierce Field mm. so it is right. there so I, I yeah so I did, so it's on the way if you drive up uh, from the roundabout just as you go into Chepstow and you head towards Tinton, you go through St. Albans. So it's up there, other side of Chepstow Racecourse. That's right. Yes, very close to Chepstow Racecourse, as we'll see a little bit later on. But this was a place, Piercefield, that was at one time described as a godly scene by none other than the poet Coleridge. Oh, God. So, um, and William Wordsworth knew about it. Uh, Lord Nelson is rumoured to have stayed there. So it did get uh, uh, quite famous. Now, the place has been in record since the 14th century. Yeah. And for most of the time, the Walter family appear to have uh, lived there. Uh, around about 1700, they enlarged the house. And um, the chap that did it was the architect of Chatsworth House. So this was very much a smaller job for him, William oh, Tolman. Yeah. But we start our story with uh, someone always claimed that he was related to the Walter family, but I haven't been able to really uh, corroborate that, but I'm sure some people have, mm. uh, called Colonel Morris. And he headed off, and his father headed off, to the Caribbean, where the Morris family made a huge fortune in the Caribbean. Um, Antigua was where they owned a large estate. And Colonel Morris came back, and he was the one who bought Piercefield uh, for £8,250. In Good 1740. Lord, that's, a, that's a substantial figure for that amount of time. It's not bad. I mean, the colonel uh, he didn't live too long to enjoy it. He died three years mm. later, and his son, who was the same name, actually, if it was the colonel. The much magnificent most... Valentine Morris II. So yes. why waste a good name? That's what we say. It's a great name, Valentine was, Morris. If, if I'm right, he was, I'm looking at my notes here, um, former governor of St. Vincent's. Supposedly. You're jumping ahead here, Goff. This is a chronologically oh. marked thing. These are spoilers. He will also tell spoilers. you, if, if you go to a murder mystery, you will find out who did the murder in about the 20th minute. From but no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. But the fact yeah. that, that that's known hmm. suggests that Valentine Morris did leave a mark, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, he was quite well known. I came across him in a sort of a previous existence uh, of things I was uh, researching. Um, but Valentine Morris was, uh, I tell you what, let's get a little picture of him up here. It's a very romantic character in many ways. There he is. Oh, Splendid gosh. Fellow. There's Valentine Morris. 
And he was uh, very romantic in his outlook and uh, he decided to redesign the grounds of Piercefield in an extraordinarily new way, embracing nature, uh, that sort of thing. But he did it with help from a poet called Richard Owen Cambridge. So it's a poet's uh, oh, input yeah. has gone into these grounds and these gardens. Uh, it's near the Wye Valley, so it just caught the big Wye Valley tourist, the first yeah. tourist industry to start up there with Tintin Abbey and all of that sort mm. of thing. And for a while, Piercefield was right up there with Tintin uh, for visitors and reputation. Um, so what Valentine Morris did was he, oh dear, let's get that a little bit bigger. He embraced nature. He used nature. So there were no statues, nothing like that. It had to be as if nature had produced it. And it's such a beautiful part of Monmouthshire. Oh, it and be, yeah. But it's quite a dangerous part as well. Yeah. So these walks through the woods. You've got these two here. This precipitous drop to certain <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, In fact, I read a blog. I was on the internet about p people recently go into Piercefield. And they said, if you don't like heights, you might struggle at times. Oh gosh! Don't go for a but the danger added a certain frisson. You see, yeah. uh, he had a grotto, which had quartz on the walls, a druid's temple. Oh, really? that's interesting. It's like a mini amphitheater. Yeah. He had a cold bath, which was a plunge pool with changing facilities. Oh god! Yeah. <laughs> now this has got a different connotation since the first half of the twentieth century, but he had something called the Eagle's Nest. Oh, where yes, you, could, right. you could be in the eagle's nest and your view, you know, you could see Gloucestershire. Yeah. It was extraordinary. It was a two-tiered uh, uh, contraption. And let's have a little look. So some of the views, as you can see, were pretty, uh, pretty spectacular today. Gosh, that's, that's incredible, isn't it? So you're up there near the eagle's yeah. nest and you're seeing the why, and it's an extraordinary view. Oh, On it a is, clear actually. day, my goodness, the things you mm. can see. So oh, that is a stop. You can tell why the sort of the, the, the poets fell in love with it, can't you? Oh. Not, only got, not only you've got a romantic ruin, but when you've got a you know a, a valley like that, the Y Valley, it's just so absolutely astonishing to see. Here's one of my favorite bits. This is Lover's Leap. Oh god. <laughs> the drop is 180 feet. Oh my goodness. They deliberately made the railings low to add to the <laughs> drama. <laughs> <laughs> no health and safety yeah, in Valentine the drama Lord. of dropping over yeah. <laughs> that road in the distance that must be the road that's still there that you follow around into Tintin yes I think it probably is Yeah. yeah. Um, Valentine Morris at one point had an overhanging branch here and he asked workmen if they would cut it because it was disturbing the view but it meant going over the rail and going oh. down 50 feet and none of the yeah. workmen would do it yeah. No matter how much money was offered. So Valentine Morris did it himself. He got yeah. reins and he essentially, yeah. in, se in the 1750s, abseiled. Good grief. He abseiled down there. He to bungeed off Lover's Leap. <laughs> bungeed off Lover's Leap. But it's a good job that uh, uh, the tree was there uh, a couple of years before. On, because on a wander, Valentine Morris missed his footing and plunged over Lover's Leap and was saved by a tree like in a cartoon. Good God. I like to think he sprang back up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Whether... And his legs kept going like that for a while before he suddenly went, ah! <laughs> is what generally what happens in cartoons, I'm led to believe. Uh, but my, one of my favourite bits, though, that he invented. Oh, this is another view. You also saw Chepstow Castle, you see. Yeah. You were added to the romance. Oh, God. There they all are. The alcove, another one of these spots yeah. where you could pause and have a look at the majesty of nature. As long as you didn't plunge to your doom. Yeah. Now here is, obviously today, Giant's Cave. This was great fun. And this is Giant's Cave. When Valentine Morris designed it, the paths were very narrow and it was single file and a bit more serpentine than no. they are today. Um, but there you are today. You go towards Giant's Cave and it's not natural. It's hewn in the rock about 12 yards. So you walk through yeah. the cliff. Uh, emerging as another beautiful uh, viewing platform. Oh, God. That's what it looks like when you come out today. So it yeah. jets out. You've got wonderful views. Yeah. But what used to be there, which isn't now, about here, was a carved was an enormous giant. Oh, God. And above his head, like something yeah. from Tolkien, 
He had an enormous boulder, which looked for all the world that he was going to dash your brains out as you came out, <gasps> or he was going to hurl it into the valley below. Good Lord, that's astonishing, isn't it? Sadly, by 1805, the report is that the giant had no arms. <laughs> and it wasn't, long. Stone up, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't long before frosts came and he yeah. slowly but surely disintegrated. Yeah. So that's where the giant used to be. Yeah. Giant's Cave. So it's quite an exciting place he had here. Look at the yeah. views. Well, amazing, I mean, you could eat those views, couldn't you? That's Absolutely nice. incredible. Um, and again, nothing formal about what he did, but it was great fun. Uh, and he also basically, he had no idea of business. So he let everyone in, the park was open, and you'd turn up um, and servants without livery would appear and offer you refreshment. You weren't allowed to tip them. I know what no. that, I know that feeling. Uh, <laughs> you were, right, we've been there. <laughs> we've been there, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> weren't allowed to tip them, but they would bring you food and they would bring you, you things. And uh, the, the inn, I wonder if it's the same one you mentioned, the innkeeper was given full access to Valentine Morris's cellar and food and food provisions for anyone who wanted food afterwards in the inn that had visited oh, the Lord. land. Now, this shows no business sense whatsoever. No. It's the equivalent of Cadu or English Heritage or the National Trust saying, thank you for coming. Do exit via the gift shop and help yourself to what's there. Yeah, yeah, go on. Have a few rubbers. Go on. <laughs> have a few rubbers. It's not really... Pencils, all right. You're not much. Have a, have a couple of pencils. Go on. It's not really a very... Um, <laughs> it's not really a very successful sort of business model. By the way, when no. you went near the giant's cave, uh, a gardener... <laughs> oh, you okay? <laughs> a gardener would appear and you'd be advised to next time you come, bring some gunpowder. <laughs> Because they had a cannon near Giant's Cave. And what yeah. they would do is if you gave them gunpowder, as you walk through Giant's Cave, they would fire off the cannon and the reverberations were quite extraordinary by all accounts. This is the Morris's sort of play thing, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is, isn't it? It's just a toy. It's, it uh, is a, a toy. A rich man's toy. But, well, he, um, but he did, um, as you said, he wasn't a very good businessman because he did go bust, didn't he? But, um, yeah, he's 18, 1786, was it? Again, it's on its way, him going bust. But what he did oh, was he, first of all, um, he was very popular in the local area in Chepstow for his, again, you know what it's like when they're very rich with no idea of money, sort of no, showered no. around princely hospitality, I think they call it, mm. don't they? Mm. He did that a lot, so they loved him. Uh, but also, he, he was the one, uh, you've mentioned this in the past when we've been in various pubs talking about the roads of Monmouthshire. He was the one that decided to lobby for turnpike roads or roads of any kind in Monmouthshire and Gloucestershire because the roads were so bad. He was the oh. one that went to Parliament to lobby them. And he said, we have no roads of any note in Monmouthshire. And the, the uh, sort of the uh, expert, the sort of the officials said, well, how do you travel in Monmouthshire? Yeah. Valentine Morris replied, we travel in ditches, mainly. Oh, it was him said that, was it? I've heard yeah. that quote, you travel through a series of ditches. Yes, the roads have all sunk so much and up the side you would get, yeah. Oh, gosh, that's interesting. Yeah, you were the one that told me that one. I was surprised yeah. to find out it was him as well. Yeah. Uh, but thanks to him, over 300 miles of roads were put into Monmouthshire and Gloucestershire. Now, that didn't um, really endear him to the local gentry. Who hmm. weren't happy at these new roads going on their land. He was always an outsider, Valentine Morris. Hmm. Um, always an outsider. But he reached the stage, where, and also he was addicted to gambling as well. Gambling oh, and gaming. Right, yeah. So as you pointed a lot, a lot out... A people were in the 18th century. It seemed to be a big problem amongst the sort of landed gentry and, and sons and daughters of families going bust. <laughs> yeah, if you had the money, you didn't always keep hmm. it very often, did you? It was part of the Grand Tour. You went off on the Grand Tour and you spent most of your time floating around casinos. I mean, when you finally got to Venice at the end of a vast casino in the 18th century. Well, actually, it was one vast brothel with a casino. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, they, and it, it was such part of their industry at in, uh, in that point that um, the gambling tables couldn't operate unless an official state senator was um, actually occupying the gambling table. This is, so this is much no wonder people like you know Morris like this, and they would they were the people who had gone over the through the systems on the Grand Tour. No wonder they came back with extremely bad behaviour. 
questionable diseases and the habits that lasted a lifetime that ruined them. <laughs> Another way, a surefire way of losing money was to stand for Parliament. And uh, Morris had decided that that was the next step for him. And fortunately for him, there were very few contested elections in Monmouthshire in the 18th century, but this was the most famed of all of them. Because in 1771, the county of Monmouthshire MP, Colonel Thomas Morgan of Tredega, uh, died at the age of 44, and there was an opening at last. Now, Colonel Thomas believed, well, the next MP will be his younger brother, John Morgan, who ended up living at Rupera Castle. Um, and Valentine Morris thought, no, actually, I'm hmm. going to stand. We're going to have a contested election for a change. Um, he rightly pointed out that John Morgan uh, of Rupera was already an MP. <laughs> you see, it was... He it wanted was the, two seats. <laughs> well, he, no, he didn't want two seats. Oh. He wanted the prestige of the county seat. Today oh, we see. see seats in terms of safe seat or marginal. Back then yeah. you had borough and county, and the county held more prestige for some reason. Oh, it goes back to the old Knights of the Shire, that Tudor yeah. idea that you're representing a county, you know, rather than a borough or a town. That's a strange it's, idea, though. It, it goes into the snobbery, and the Morgans yeah. believed that they were basically entitled to the county of Monmouthshire seat. Uh, now, Morris had the backing of the Duke of Beaufort and Lord Abergavenny. Now, I think the Duke of Beaufort basically wanted to see a Morgan lose, than necessarily yeah. wanted to see Morris win. Yeah. Uh, the Morgans had the Hanbury family, and Clive of India, Lord Clive, who at one point offered £52,000 to Valentine Morris to buy Piercefield, but the deal fell through. Well, that would have mm. solved his money problems, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, at the last minute, swung his support to the Morgans. So Morris lost Clive of India, uh, but he was always up against it, you know. Uh, uh, taking on a Morgan in Monmouthshire, they fight dirty. Oh, yeah. And some of the stuff that was thrown around by Valentine Morris it didn't help that Valentine Morris made this impassioned plea. He said to the electors of Monmouthshire, use your independence. Don't vote the way you usually do. Cast off your shackles. Now, for a slave owner to say that, that yes. was manna from heaven for the Morgan campaign, well, quite. who responded with these wonderful, well, not wonderful, this pretty dirty campaign, these verses, these songs that have survived. So a little bit of it says this, no upstart Creole shall this county control, though ever so active and eager, what are sugars and rum to the excellent stum and the home-brewed ale of Tredega? <laughs> in a, in a far distant land, my friends, as I hear, he keeps many slaves, and I own that I fear he who makes men slaves there would make them so here. Oh, that's a very, very interesting little line, isn't it? That's a, it's a dirty old yeah. battle, isn't it? Yeah. Dirty old battle, but it ended the way these sorts of battles usually end. First of all, Morris wanted the writ to be read uh, in Usk, Beaufort Territory, not in Newport, which you may as well rename Morganville, yeah. Morgan Stronghold. But in the end, the result was Valentine Morris, 535, John Morgan, 743. Oh. So it was a spirited attempt, yeah. except the fact it cost Valentine Morris £6,000 at least to lose that campaign. Yeah. Now, Which is a phenomenal amount of money in today's terms. Enormous. Now, added on to all the money he spent at Pierce Field hmm. and the gambling tables and gaming, he was ruined, as you said earlier on. Hmm. He was ruined. So he thought the only thing he could do was leave Pierce Field. And there's this scene where he gets into his carriage and he maintains a stiff upper lip until he gets out of the estate and he hears the muffled peals of the bell of the local church in mourning. And at that, oh. Valentine Morris started to sob. Oh, yeah. He sobbed all the way to Antigua, where his enormous estate was, and, and he went there. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, that's all right then. That's all he right. landed on his feet then. Yeah. He did. He started, to re <laughs> he started to rebuild his fortunes, and it was said he almost made a second Pierce field uh, in Antigua. So he was getting back on his feet there. So much so that in 1770, uh, Two, he became the governor of St. Vincent's, as you oh, said earlier yeah. on. Yeah, governor he became the governor. Problem is, that was a poison chalice. Yeah. 
Because for some reason, people, the establishment never liked Valentine Morris. And the French had only just lost St. Vincent's or St. Vincent as it is today. Mm. And Valentine Morris had no money from Britain whatsoever. So to govern the island and to defend the island from the French, he used his own money. Oh, good grief. He thought at some point, surely he would be reimbursed by the (laughs) British government, by London, but his letters weren't answered. And eventually the French did take back St. Vincent's, albeit temporarily in 1779, and Morris came home as the man who lost Hmm. his island. He proved by facts that it wasn't Valentine Morris's fault at all. Yeah. So he thought, well, I might get some of my money reimbursed. Instead, they threw him in debtor's prison. (laughs) I didn't realize that. He was there for years. Yeah. Did he use the time well, he says? Well, there's not much you can do in in debtor's prison. I know that just shortly, the year before he died, he wrote a very spirited defense. Oh, he did. Of his his, um, behavior in um, Antigua. And did did he do that while he was in debtor's prison? Uh, when he first, uh, earlier, oh, when I think first, that was, but, it was pub- right. but you're right, it was published just before he died. Uh, yeah. Yes, he had no, it wasn't his fault what he did at St. Vincent's, but the money problem was utterly severe. He was pretty much destitute. King's Bench Prison, which in David Copperfield is the debtor's prison that Dickens sends Mr. Micawber to. Oh, well, right. yeah. He was there for several years <laughs> and all his friends melted yeah. away. Yeah. All his jewels were sold. Everything was gone. His poor wife, I mean, she tried to commit suicide. In the end, she ended up in an asylum. Oh, God. Morris's life completely disintegrated. Mm-hmm. Um, he sold uh, Pierce Field um, for, uh, how much was that? that, that what, he could have got more for it. Remember, it was 52000 It looked as if Clive was going to buy it for. Yeah, he sold it for 26200 in 1785 to a banker uh, called George Smith from Durham. So he sold it and- um, He had a property in Usk as well, I saw, he sold as well, which apparently got at a a knockdown price as well. Yeah, about half of what it was worth. Again, Clive bought that, I think. I thought it was Clive that bought that, I remember reading that. Yeah, so so there's not much left uh, for poor old Valentine Morris at this point. And uh, he eventually gets out, Lord North releases him, eventually. but then he dies in 1789 in, his, uh, in a relative's home in London. Um, and you know, now Goff, if you ever have a biography of you done, <laughs> yeah. so there are many tales, many tales um, that could be said. Yeah, I, don't know, I would like to have left out. <laughs> yes. I don't know if you've ever thought what a good title for your biography might be. Uh, uh, but you know that your life has ended not as you would want it, when your biography comes with the title <laughs> The Unfortunate Valentine Morris. <laughs> the Unfortunate Valentine yeah. Morris. <laughs> yes, uh, sort of a 90-page yeah. thing, uh, a book written in the uh, 1960s, The Unfortunate oh, yeah. Valentine Morris. <laughs> ah. So we get sold yeah. to this guy called George Smith, you see, in uh, 1785. Mm. And I think at this point, you know, I think it was cursed, the building. Really? I, yeah, I think whoever bought it was going to be have uh, monetary difficulties because George Smith had no monetary difficulties. He was the founder in 1788 of the Monmouthshire Bank. Oh. And he had so much money, he rebuilt uh, Pierce Field. He built a very fine uh, house there, or he started rebuilding Pierce Field. Um, and his, he lived there with his wife and his incredible daughter. Now, this is Elizabeth Smith. So this is the 1780s, yeah. early 1790s. I'm quite fond of Elizabeth Smith. I mean, she was extraordinary. Uh, she could speak Hebrew as comfortably as speak in French. Oh. I dread to think how many languages she understood. She was proficient oh, in music. It was yeah, said she was on. the first, one of the first women to uh, climb uh, Snowdon. Um, she's uh, a well-known biblical scholar. She was a yeah. translator of renown, and she was an amazing linguist. And as a teenage girl, she spent her years in the library at Pierce Field House. Uh, but I do like her for this reason, you know. I mean, we've both dabbled in history in the past, Goff, right? Yeah. 
And you know how sneery, and I say this as an historian myself, you know how sneery historians can sometimes be. Yeah, quite. <laughs> um, so she decided once she was with a friend and she was in the grounds of Piercefield and thinking romantic thoughts and dreaming romantic dreams. And she was reading about our old friend, Llewellyn Ap Griffith, who appeared in our last episode. Oh, of course, yes. Found in a wall in, uh, in Flanderlundy Hall. Yeah, that's when we last heard from him. <laughs> yeah, that's when we last heard from him. <laughs> well, he's a cameo. I don't think we can cram him into every episode, but he's no. appeared, no, appeared he's not in like this. the Duke of Beaufort who can get in anywhere. Well, he made, he made the first two, and we dumped the Duke of Beaufort. He's, he isn't doing enough at the moment, Goff. Uh, well, lazy. To together. He's just lazy. <laughs> um, but anyway, she read about the battle where, where she read, Near the Y, Llewellyn the Last was killed. And as she sat near the Y, she convinced herself that it was in Piercefield Park <laughs> that Llewellyn was killed, with no evidence. Uh, and she said, ah, oh, yeah, that's probably why it's called Piercefield. They pierced him in this field. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she said to a friend, she said, I tell you what we should do. She said, why don't we pretend we've dug up an old poem which was translated from the original Welsh. She, she knew a bit of Welsh as well. She yeah. was annoyingly brilliant, this woman, yeah, yeah. Um, as a teenager. Close to genius, you would say. Um, and what we'll do is we will say, <coughs> this is proof. And these letters yeah. go back and forth where this friend isn't keen on this. And at one point, Elizabeth says, well, fair enough. If you don't want to be a forger, I'll have to do it myself. <laughs> it wasn't a mislead. It was obviously just a romantic kind of notion, yeah. you know. Um, but she did. Um, and she became very, very well known. Um, in fact, she got into, in later years, the Victorian Book of Good Women. Oh, dear me. <laughs> which didn't sell as much, obviously, as the Book of Bad Women. Bad Women, you know, that went into several interesting volumes with <laughs> illustrations, I'm going to believe. <laughs> but, her, but her letters pick up on the downfall fortunes of her father because in 1793, war with France, and in the general panic, the Monmouthshire Bank collapsed. Oh. And all the Smith fortunes vanished. Mm -hmm. And she writes about the bailiffs turning up at the front door and hammering on the door and them not answering and uh, sort of hiding. Oh. Um, they, they managed to escape the wolf from the door, but only just, you know, you're in a mansion mm -hmm. and you've got the yeah, bailiffs yeah. banging on the door. Okay. Uh, you know, it is quite extraordinary. Um, and of course, she died young, which also helped put her in the Victorian book of the good women. Mm. Um, she was out one day and she was dreaming and reading and she didn't realize that the dew had fallen. And she got oh. damp and caught a chill and she felt a stab in pain. And sadly, actually, for the last year of her life, she was just slowly getting iller and iller, and she died in 1806 at the age of 29. Oh, gosh, that's very sad, isn't it? And a biography of hers has finally been written, coincidentally, just a few months ago. I haven't read it, but it's by Sarah Holmes Griffiths called The Foolhardy Angel, A Life of Elizabeth Smith. So oh, I have to get, have to get in touch yeah. have a little look at that. So I quite like Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, but most of the time it must have been a building site because his dad had to rebuild Valentine Morris's house. Oh, right. Because it was never about the house, Piersfield. It was always about the park. Yeah. You know, no one really cared that much about the house. Yeah. So this is what happened. This is how it looked when the builders were eventually finished. Right. Uh, well, that's really, that's interesting. Smith did this bit, oh, yeah. the main bit. Uh, the famous Sir John Soane was the architect of this. But mm -hmm. the Smiths left before it was finished. Uh, they left in 1794. And so a, uh, Colonel Wood uh, took over, and Colonel Wood finished it by doing these pavilions. The, the pavilions I named, yeah. One used to be a ballroom. Oh, gosh. And the architect for that was a guy called, uh, where is he? Jo uh, Joshua Bonomi. Sorry, Joseph Bonomi. And Joseph Bonomi's claim to fame was that he appears in Sense and Sensibility. Oh, oh, gosh. He has a name check. Robert Ferrers showing off to, um, uh, mm. and lying to Eleanor Dashwood. Says that he's hired Bonomi to build him three mansions, but I rejected all of them because I far prefer a cottage. He lies <laughs> to the cottage dwelling Eleanor Dashwood. <laughs> so there we go. 
And Wood did a fair few things, and he was the MP. He was an MP for Newark, I believe. But he wasn't as famous as when he sold it for ninety thousand pounds over dinner. In eighteen, 18- how many? In eighteen oh two, for ninety thousand. Ninety thousand over dinner. Good. Over dinner, he sold it to Nathaniel Wells, which I ah. think, Goff, is where you are going to come in. Am I? Well, a little bit. Because Nathaniel well, I mean, I Wells... Thought you were going to do, I thought you were going to do Wells. When I'll, it's, it's very intriguing, a business, because you touched on it earlier on, that there is, um, throughout Monmouth and throughout the area, really, there is this background of slavery money, which is floating around in there. And Valentine Morris, again, you mentioned an awful lot of the money for Peelsfield House came from um, that slavery, from the slavery money put into it. And a hell of a lot of... of Basically, Monmouthshire residents own slaves. This is a, it has been a real surprise to me to discover this. We've sort of put our slavery history aside in this country because we think that we were all very, very altruistically stopped it. Well, we only stopped it in the mainland. We, we, we allowed people to continue owning slaves in the colonies for a very, 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 very long time afterwards. And it's not until you get to until 1834 when the government finally had, really finally had enough of it, sort of as, as an issue, and shut the system down, you were no longer allowed to own slaves anywhere in the empire. And they sat and they paid a compensation for it. Um, so, yeah, so Wells was one of the people who were compensated as, a, as a, a slave owner at the time. There were, I just checked my notes, there were 15 compensated slave owners in uh, Monmouthshire. In 18, 1834. Remember, this is only five years before the Chartist uprising in Newport in 1839. There were 15 people who owned between them 2,025 slaves in the, in the West Indies. That is astonishing, isn't it? In general, you remember. The, the, the chap called Thomas Philpotts owned the most. He owned 772 and the, and the one the, the fewest ones I can mention was a chap called J- James Jenkins, who I'll, I'll come back to later on, who only really mentions about four and others he has, but he actually has named those in an interest, it was interesting as well, so I'll come back to that. Yeah, but it, Wells himself, though, is particularly interesting because uh, he was the son of a slave. His mother was called Judy. Yes, yeah. And though, they were, though he had sisters, they weren't going to inherit. His father had had many other illegitimate children all around the place. Um, lots of, but, he was a, a, but he was acknowledged as the heir. And he became the heir of Peersfield. He became Sheriff of Monmouth. So this is a, cha- man, a, cha- a man who was born a slave, of a slave, legitimised, and then becomes eventually, you know, gets Pierce Field House. Interesting that he buys the house of another of the Morrises, former slavers as well. So you wonder whether they'd heard of the property, uh, you know, from the connections with that. Um, and he comes over. Now you think there was somebody with a slavery background. Um, he wouldn't have been so keen on the idea, but he didn't. He kept all of them. He kept all of the slaves. And he was one of the people who were compensated in 1834. Uh, for owning slaves. Now, yeah. That is really quite remarkable. It is fascinating. I mean, you're right. I mean, f- like you say, first black sheriff in Britain yeah. in 1818, yeah. the second black commission in the British uh, Armed Forces in 1820. I mean, extraordinary. He does seem to be remarkably accepted into society. In fact, he was a magistrate, so he had power over white people, but he, but back in the Caribbean, if that wouldn't have happened. No, no. You know, it would it, 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 very I mean, odd. Do we know, have we got pictures, any pictures of Wells? There is no known surviving picture of Nathaniel oh, Wells. Fascinating, because you wonder, because also we, we talk a lot nowadays about identity politics, and he does seem, he doesn't seem to identify with um, his mother's side of his origin, does he? He definitely identifies with his father's side. Um, because he mm. steps into that bracket, that cultural bracket. And the fact that he's sort of obviously accepted as this as well. I mean, we're drawing massively here on uh, 
I'm conjecturous to appearance, but I mean, he may not have been, he may have been slightly fairer skin, fairly complexion, fair complexion. There um, is one description, uh, contemporary description, remarking on how dark he was. But then again, that is relative. That's by comparison to yeah, them. That is relative. It? You know, it's a, it's a fascinating, the subject, I mean, skin tone and the way it affects things goes on into, well, now, you know, you look at any movie, the blackest black man is the villain. The palest black man is the hero. Um, so, I mean, that sort of thing. So these don't, but he definitely seems to culturally ident take on that identity of the father mm. and gets again, accepted into it as well. But people must have known. But I find the fascinating thing about this period as well is that the people owning it are, are pretty, oh, slave owners in Monmouthshire at the time, are pretty high up the establishment ladder. They're not, you know, they're down at the bottom somewhere or in these are These are major figures. And you seem to think, well, people must have known where the money came from. Um, they, they had to have. And, and, and if not, the gossip factory amongst this oligarchy of families that ran won the show and ran Britain at the time as well, they must have known where the money came from. I think it's a um, see no evil, hear no evil, but yeah. use the weapon if you need it. Such as well, the they, like when they when the Morgans used it against uh, Morris, mm -hmm. that is again with this. You know, by, by this point, the Morgans themselves they're not listed as compensated slave okay. owners in 1834. We've actually, I don't think there are many records to indicate that they ever did own it, but we know full well that that family got money from slavery because of um, their uncle John the Merchant, mm -hmm. John Morgan the Merchant, who mm -hmm. was involved in the Triangle traffic. Yeah. Well, yeah, goods to Africa, slaves from Africa to America, goods home from Africa. Um, so, I mean, again, it's, it's, a, it's a, 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 a shady, audible background business to it that went on, and, and the amounts were enormous. But interestingly enough, Wells wasn't even the, the only sheriff of Monmouth to actually be a, a compensated slave owner. The other mm -hmm. chap was um, a, a Colonel Court Holt Bateman. Um, who was sheriff of Monmouth at the time of the trial of the Chartist, uh, Chartist uprising. And he was the man who actually summoned the panel, as it was called at the Assizes, to set up the grand jury to see whether they would go forward to trial. Mm. Um, Bateman, was, he was Irish uh, background. He lived in Bertolli House in, uh, near Usk. Interesting little connection with that one, Arthur Machen, features Bertolli House in a lot of his works. Right. And he had a strange fixation with Bertolli House, as seen as something of our strange arcane occult power. All sorts of unpleasant things happen in Bertolli House. Yeah, but I mean, he lived in, um, in Bertolli House. Uh, he owned 270 slaves in 1834, and he was compensated uh, for all of them. He had them on two separate estates to the tune, um, I should read it out, is, uh, of £5,042, one shilling and a penny. Oof. They even went down to the pennies, which is the, the most amazing thing. Mm. Now, that is, this is 1834. That, in today's terms, had the buying power, power I checked this up on various inflation calculators, of £659, £65, and 67 pence. Mm. Getting down to the pences rather than giving the old one. But that is a huge amount of money. So if he got that for 270, how much money did Bill Potts get for 770? Extraordinary amount. It's an extraordinary amount of money. And yeah. of course, and all the, if you look at all the, you know, the worthies that are swarming around after um, uh, Bateman has, has, uh, has called the panel for the jury, You've got all a massive of them, uh, of, of, of them, and if you go through them, there's at least six of them, all of whom are intimates of the Morgan family. So you have the Rodneys, William Rodney. You have Reginald Blewett of the Mom's Remurling Connection. Uh, Samuel Humphrey, who mm -hmm. was now what's it? His brother, I always get mixed up with this. And Humphrey's relation to Sir Charles was Humphrey son married into the family. So son-in-law. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Brother-in-law to the Sir Charles you're thinking of. Brother-in-law to Sir Charles, I always get that mixed up. Octavius Swinnerton Morgan Esquire, who of course is uh, Sir Charles Morgan's son. Um, another name not necessarily, I know they are connected or not, but you had John Etherington Welsh Rolls of the Rolls-Royce mm -hmm. family is there. So he's one of the people on the, on the uh, trial of, of 
uh, of the Chartists as well. But on this list, there's a little interesting quirk. You remember we, I mentioned a chap called John, uh, James Jenkins, who is listed as having four. Now, James Jenkins dies at the same time, same year as William Morris, more or less, 1786. And in his will, he leaves various slaves to a lady friend in the West Indies, a Miss Dorothy Ducommon. So he leaves her certain things. He leaves his houseboy, his, 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 his Negro boy, as he's referred to, to her. Um, and various other properties eventually get sold off as well. And, uh, and they... Um, uh, and they mention four slaves by name. And there are others by indication, but they only mention names. But the name, quite fascinating. Uh, James Jenkins named his four of his slaves in the West Indies uh, Pembroke, Monmouth, Newport, and Cardiff. That was their names. That was the, yeah. Cardiff was the, the slave boy that got left to Dorothy. Dorothy and Next before that, just just what you say, Valentine Morris's slaves were called Beaufort, Piercefield, and Chepstow. Generation <laughs> before, yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of vaguely horrified by it. It's what you'd name a racehorse or something. It's not they, these aren't people's names. No, they're, they're slave brand, names. They're, they're brand names that yeah. you stick on them, branding your property, your play, your background. Uh, and Je I mean, James Jenkins' property in there was called was Llanblethian Hill. So again, mm -hmm. rather like Morgan, so Amy Morgan and his various estates named after places they came from. But the interesting thing about James Jenkins, James Jenkins dies in, uh, in 1786. Um, and he has surviving brothers and sisters. And the, survive the sisters get £25 each. Sister his, his brother gets £10 each. But his brother is called John Jenkins. And if you look down the list of worthies on um, at the grand jury, the, the, the grand jury panel, there is John Jenkins Esquire. Mm. Now, I doubt it's the same person, but all they seem to know about James Jenkins is that he was a family in Abergavenny. Mm. So he's a Monmouthshire family. They say the, the site I was looking at, which is, oh dear me, I've lost the thread of the the title of it. Now, what was that site we were looking at, Paul? I'll put, I'll put the link in the description okay. below. Well, the site says that they're a family, but they still can't track down the descendants of, of, of James Jenkins. Wow. But wouldn't it be interesting? I, there's over 40 years gap. So I, if it is the John Jenkins that's mentioned in the will, John Jenkins Esquire, then he must have been a very young brother mm. um, and quite an old uh, man in his 60s or 70s by the time he gets to the trial. But it's perfectly possible it could have been a nephew. Yeah. Well, I, I think mean, no, again, this is just speculation, but isn't that fascinating? Because yeah. again, to be called Esquire means you were of gentlemanly stock. Yeah. Um, and interesting where the money might have come from. Well, I think that I think there's definitely a, uh, an episode on that alone. I think the Chartist trial and the uh, oh. and the local worthies. As far as a Wells got, but the, the, but the irony of it, you've got a, you've the Chartist uprising was about the enfranchisement. Of politically of ordinary people and one of the people sitting in that courtroom owned 272 people I beg your pardon um, I must get his crimes right I got the number wrong there <laughs> but, but he owned well seven years before he 270 did, yeah. yeah awful yeah well Wells of course also got his got money for his slaves as you say yeah um, he had lots of children. He had 22 children. And it was said, Good if you God. went to, to Pierce, so he got up very early in the morning. Um, and if you Mrs. went to, Wells must have got yes. up quite late. So if I you can went say. to a Pierce <clears throat> Field house, uh, you sometimes had a tour inside. You couldn't go into some of the rooms because they were full of little Wellses. Uh, but Nathaniel God. Wells continued the tourism. Um, it, so from about 1750 to 1850 was when Piercefield's tourism was at its peak. And there's some wonderful sort of versions of TripAdvisor of the time, of what people <laughs> actually thought, you know. Um, it is extraordinary. Where have I got this? Ah, here we are. Now, Joseph Banks, scientist and traveller, said, I am more and more convinced that this is by far the most beautiful place I ever saw. Later on, sadly, Emily Hall of Bromley, <laughs> thought her three shillings weren't worth it and said, I should say to anyone wanting to go to Piercefield, don't. <laughs> One star. 
<laughs> well, yeah. the, the latest, yeah. the last guidebook was, 18, was 1898. Um, and this is very late, but I love this. If it be a Tuesday, the open day, the gatekeeper will at once furnish you with a little man for a guide. <laughs> through the torturous leafy groves, bringing you unexpectedly into some of the most exquisite spots of romantic beauty. A little man they provided you uh, with. Uh, this is a, there must be a tradition, Paul, because when you were at Tadiga House, you were a little man. A little yes, man used... appeared at the door and took you around. This is true. a tradition in Monmouthshire, having little blokes. Well, I, I like to continue these traditions. Um, <laughs> Wells left the area in the 1840s and uh, John Russell took over, who was in charge of Risker Colliery Company. And he was there for a while. He'd only opened the parks very occasionally. So it kind of stopped this great tourism industry. Uh, it had a terrible disaster at his Risker Black Vein Colliery with 146 deaths with a gas explosion. And at that, his company went bankrupt. Russell sold up. Um, one of his relatives, his descendants, said that Russell sold Piercefield to have money to set up a trust fund for the families of those that died at the Black Vein disaster. So it seems it must have hit him hard. Uh, when he left in 1860, the Clay family took over. And the Clay family were there right up to the very end, which was 1921, when the house looked something like this so it's still you know you've still oh, yeah, got it's still recognizable that um, from that uh, sketch we saw earlier isn't it yeah. the only thing that's gone is the little pagoda on the top of it oh no no it's still there i can see well, it's still yeah. there um the last one to die clay died oh. uh at the age of 96 in 1921 and the house Gosh. more or less uh died with him really because in 1926 um the chepstow racecourse company of which the clays were directors wanted to build Chepstow Racecourse, which they did uh, right next to, really, uh, Pierce Field. And they left Pierce Field, and they mm. left it to go to, to rack and ruin, really. Um, I, I don't know whether to believe... In fact, we, if we look at it as it looks today... Oh, blimey, that's worse since I've seen it. There you go. Last yeah. I saw of it, it was more intact than that. Good grief, yes, it's, it's gone, isn't it? Uh, it has. There are sort of stories. I know that Lancaster bombers during the Second World War were actually stored here before going oh. into service. But there is a tale, I suspect apocryphal, that the Americans used the mansion as target practice. I think they did do live ammunition um, practice in there, but which probably didn't do much to the structure. But I don't think no. they aimed for the house. I've noticed the Americans get blamed for an awful lot of things they didn't do. Yes, right. Yeah. The most famous of that was Rupera Castle near Macken, the old Morgan home or second home. Yeah. And for years, certain local people would say, "Ah, oh, the Americans burnt it down." The fire took place the night before Pearl Harbor, Pearl before Harbor. the Americans were even in the war. So, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. But it does look in uh, such a terrible state. It's owned by the Rubens brothers now. Who again, have uh, people are trying to save it, but it's in a very bad way. Uh, well, where would you see? start, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole um, different ball game to saving something like um, Llanrunley Hall or Kef and Mabley, is it? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complete rebuild, virtually. As ever, it's, it's the park remains more important than the house, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you wouldn't guess this, Goff, because it's subtle, but this is an, an Alami stock photo. Did you, did you see that? <laughs> I did just spot it. I thought it might have been. I well, didn't you, like to say anything. You've got a good <coughs> nose. You've got a good nose for these. But I, I, I can... But the, the, <laughs> this is the best picture I could find because you see Pierce Field here. Yeah. How beautiful it still is. All yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this is Chepstow Racecourse. Oh, right. Now I know. Ah, just now I can see exactly. So it really is very near, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, very near. So, um, I haven't been, as I said, to Piercefield, and it is something of a paradise lost. As you say, you can't always have a happy ending, can you, Goff? You can't always. No, no an awful lot of, of properties and things have gone um, in Wales. Um, it's just the nature of the, what, of, of, of the beast, I think, particularly in Wales. Um, is an awful lot of the big families just didn't stay after a certain point and left. So, um, so, and, and again, the people talked about, you know, political will to keep them going as well, the change of political emphasis. It's, it's, uh, 
and you can can you keep everything? No. Sometimes, I mean, I sometimes think I remember the Victorians. We talk about the Victorians. They talk about restoring churches. They don't. They just completely mashed them around, knocked about, and built them as they thought they should be. So the Victorians were appallingly bad at knocking down. I mean, the Victorians that built Newport and medieval Newport, an awful lot of which was standing up, up into the early parts of the 19th century. So, I mean, they, they, it's only sometimes when things start to go and things disappear and break because you realize that the, of the value of them. So this is why we start trying to maintain what's left, I suppose. So it's an inevitable process. I've always had a bee in my bonnet about cinemas, because bit by bit yeah. cinemas are falling apart and cinemas are going. And only now, recently, people have started to say, no, we must start to preserve um, cinema architecture. And well, there's another, so, there's another, another episode, episode waiting. Now. Well, thank you, Goff. Mm. I mean, that oh, was no, great. Lovely. I'm not sure where we'll go next, but I don't know about you, but I fancy a castle. You ready for a castle, maybe? I think, we, yeah, we need to have a castle, don't we, really? Well, Get if... Get a few uh, poets in, that'd be nice as well. Oh, that sounds like a plan. Well, thank you for joining <laughs> us. Do like, share and subscribe. I heard a bigger boy say that, Goff. <laughs> All YouTube subscribers say like, share and subscribe. So if you could, oh, we'd be extraordinarily good. grateful. And yeah. uh, we shall see you again very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.